Let me read 3 through 9 of 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him, Now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now before we can talk about this passage, I need to talk to you about the whole Bible. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, you should have by now, that your Bible isn't arranged by topic. Uh, you, You can't put little tabs on the, on the corners that give you your topic of interest. Now, that frustrates some of you. You wish the Bible was arranged by topic. You think it would be easier to use. The, the fact that the Bible isn't arranged by topic is not divine editorial error. That's divine intention. The Bible is essentially a narrative. 70% of the Bible is narrative. What's the other 30%? It's God's notes. The Bible is a divinely annotated narrative. It's a theologically annotated narrative. God explains the narrative to us. And that big story is meant to unpack, exegete, explain the little story of every human being. So I live every day then with a God story mentality. One of our problems is we live with a my story mentality. We have more allegiance to our narrative than we have allegiance to God's narrative. And God is drawing you to find hope and comfort and motivation in the bigger story rather just in the little story. Now, like a good narrative, the Bible is dotted with plot summaries. Uh, Those passages that, that give us in one passage a summary of the whole story. If you're a reader of novels, you know novelists do this all the time. A good novelist knows that you'll get into the detail of the story and you'll forget the larger plot. So they'll they'll create ways of giving you the plot. Maybe that will be two old guys sitting on a park bench and they're looking back on their lives and the novelist is repeating the whole story for you so you can remember it. Or maybe that will be a dream sequence and a person will be remembering their life and that's that's a plot summary. The novelist has stuck it in there. Well, the passage we're looking at is a plot summary. It's the whole story of redemption in seven verses. You notice in the beginning, it talks about the past. It says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's the past. Notice it moves to the future. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Now notice what he says next. Though now for a little while. This is Peter's focus. His, his, his intention is to actually focus on the here and now because Peter understands it's in the here and now that we lose our way. It's in the here and now that we misunderstand the work of God. It's in the here and now that we get confused or disappointed or or doubtful. And so Peter wants to explain what it is that God is doing in the here and now. His focus is right here, right now. 